Welcome to UFO, not UFO classified. That is such a party foul. Okay, so I'm sorry. It was seven years of doing UFO classified every Friday night. And every once in a while, I'm going to have a little slip up. Welcome to Expanding Frontiers, a new show that I have put together to replace UFO classified. We are looking into broader subjects, and I'm very excited to have a new partner in crime with me, Jack Brewer, who is an excellent researcher. We, you can go to Expanding Frontiers research.org to check out all of the blogs that Jack is working on and an interview with Barry Greenwood, one of the world's foremost historians and archivists in the subject of UFOs. Both of them have been great mentors to me over the years, and I appreciate not only the hard work that they're doing on Expanding Frontiers, but I also look forward to new adventures. This will be an excellent uh, thing for all of us. So tonight is going to be an exciting night for for me, for Jack. I know that we've been looking forward to the show for a long, long time. Some of you may remember, I'm sure all of you remember Mirage Men, that's the wonderful movie documentary that was done back in 2010 that raised a lot of questions about just exactly what some of these characters were doing in the UFO world, was there espionage involved? Was Where was the disinformation? Is there a grift? There's so many questions that stemmed from that documentary and, and the book, wonderful work of our guest this evening, that I think this is going to be uh, a wonderful interview because Jack and I have been going down that rabbit hole for quite some time and have made some interesting discoveries. So I will just take a moment to add Mark and my partner in crime, Jack, to the show. Thanks for, for being here tonight. And I want to, Mark, just read off your bio because it is, first of all, I am fascinated by what you do as an electronic musician. I grew up, I've been a musician my whole life. Jack is a musician, so we totally dig that vibe. But you are a writer, electronic musician, and founder of the publishing house Strange Attractor Press. Since 2004, Strange Attractor has published critically acclaimed books from the outer edge documenting lost neglected emerging and underground currents from areas including anthropology, psychology, science and magic, natural history, literature, sound, music, film and visual arts. And they regularly host events. Can I, when you, Jack, I think we need to get some funding and just go over there. Could we do that? That'd be great. Sounds good. You'd be very well. I think the three of us could get into a whole lot of trouble, to mm -hmm. be honest. So let me just finish reading this. I'm sorry, I just get so excited. But uh, Mark's writing explores the intersections of culture, technology, magic, anomalous experience and folklore, and has appeared in numerous magazines, journals, anthologies. And then, like I mentioned, this book, 2010, The Mirage Men, explores how government, the U.S. government used and abused UFO mythology to cover their own advanced technologies and counterintelligence operations. And so... This is, you know, we'll just get started right here. And Mark, you can kind of tell us more. I want to know more about your music. So does Jack and about everything that you're doing right now, because you have a lot going on. I do. Um, well, it's lovely to be here speaking Thank to you. And I really uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm talking of the music. Um, I mean, the irony is I'm really not a musician at all. I have no training. I have no ability to play you could ask me to play, you know, chopsticks, and I certainly can't do that. But I have somehow, you know, for over 20 years, managed to have some kind of existence making um, just, uh, yeah, strange and interesting electronic music in a sort of um, broadly, I guess, um, otherworldly psychedelic vein but I, I like to you know I, I have different projects that cover different set of areas I suppose but I it's almost always instrumental and kind of expansive and I like to think of it often as landscape music kind of um, like like it's a rolling a rolling uh, landscape or an environment sort of uh, uh, unraveling around your ears and hopefully inside your head as well. But um, yeah, I um, see the sort of ex current main projects I have, I think, uh, Teleplasmist, which is a um, sort of quite far out, sort of began as a very um, raw electronic exploration um, with my friend Michael York, who's an 
an incredibly skilled musician and uh, instrument maker. Um, and um, began as sort of yeah quite sort of tonal explorations of in the in the tradition of early electronic music and has now ended up being quite a kind of um, just so yeah weird, sort of weird melodic psychedelic uh, exploratory project. But we have a, actually have a new album almost due out later this year. Um, called of, of nature and electricity which we see as our two kind of reference points really and of course electricity is natural as well um but um yeah that's a very celestial and abstract and kind of um cosmic i would say um I haven't got anything i can share at this point unfortunately but that's exciting and then um there's another more local duo. I live in Wiltshire in the west of England in sort of what used to be crop circle country. Um, that is beautiful. I've been there. Oh, right. Yeah, we're very close to Avebury Stone Circle and, and Stonehenge and places. It's lovely out here. But, and myself and my friend Neil Mortimer have a um, more kind of melodic project with Neil's got some very antiquated 1970s drum machines. And uh, we, we make slightly more conventional kind of rhythmic electronic music with that. And then the most um, far out po possibly is a four piece called The Begotten. Um, and that's three friends in London and myself, um, bass, guitar, electro me on electronics and a, a, a very, very um, unique vocalist who, um, um, Joe Roberts, who um, is has to be seen to be experienced, really, but sort of just very, um, I suppose you'd say, sort of in, in trance, shamanic, kind of often quite violent, sort of yelping and howling and whispering and wailing <laughs> uh, while we create often great walls of noise or behind us. But we started out just soundtracking a 1989 experimental silent film called Begotten by a um, American filmmaker Elias Merridge and it's uh, quite hard to describe black and white he spent a lot of shot on 60 millimeter he spent a lot of time actually degrading physically degrading the negatives and film stock to create this incredibly so sort of textured um, raw effect and the film sort of is meant to depict the death of the current aeon and the birth of a new one and it actually opens with although it's not explicit um uh a, a rather brutal death scene with uh god dying in a rocking chair and hmm. emerging from inside his corpse and giving birth to a new new world it's quite it's a very unusual wow. <laughs> unusual film but um, the original soundtrack is it's just a mighty insect stimulation, so kind of cricket sounds. So we contacted, through coincidences, actually through uh, Roland Denning, who um, made Mirage Man with us. Um, I got in touch with, he, he coincidentally met Elias in Los Angeles and said, Mark, I met this guy you'd really get on with. And uh, it turned out I was already planning on doing this soundtrack work on the, with Elias's film. So we got in touch and he gave us his blessing. And we, quite a few years ago, started doing that. And we've now been asked to do other films. And so we do kind of, we did one recently, uh, Haxan Witchcraft Through the Ages, which is a really great 1922 uh, Swedish silent film. Or is it Danish? I, it's confused which way around it is. Actually, I think it's Swedish, but the director, Benjamin Christensen, is Danish. And at the time, it was one of the biggest film productions of, of the period. And it's a kind of quite as, seems to be quite a sober documentary lecture on the history of witchcraft. But then it has just these absolutely incredible um, sort of um, fantasy sequences with built on huge sets with like hordes of 
um, lots of puppets and creatures and people in insane costumes sort of dancing around and witches flying through there. And but all then it will cut back to the doc, a, a kind of lecture about um, the his, hysteria at the um, um, Abbey of Loudun in France, or you know, amongst the nuns there, or what, whatever the subject is. But very, uh, very um, interesting, interesting film. So yes, we so do, do, we 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 um, create a kind of companion, so sort of companion atmosphere to silent films. I suppose is, is the idea. So, oh, so yes, yeah, all all very yeah, very enjoyable um, and a great mm -hmm. offset. It kind of began as an offset because I was writing so sort of twenty years ago. I was sort of writing as a, professionally and sort of sat hunched over a computer for days on end so I needed something that would get me off the computer so um and I was involved with so sort of music the music underground music scene in London so this oh, kind God, of cool. came out of that but anyway so so who are your influences musically um mostly my sort of real um so lifelong passions have really been 1970s experimental, often continental European bands, a lot of so German yeah, Krautrock and Cosmischer groups like Faust and Can and Cluster, um, Amandul, Amandul II, a lot of those guys, but also more um, the Tangerine Dream, um, uh, a big Pink Floyd fan, but also yeah, a lot of uh, noisier groups that I love as well. Um, from the, <laughs> from that from my sort of teenage years, Butthole Surfers were one of my great favorites. Well, they're always a crowd pleaser. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Early favorites of mine. Um, uh, English, love the English experimental groups that we've sort of documented through the press. So Coil and Nurse with Wound, Current ninety three. That's a kind of whole stratum of of the sort of eighties and nineties English underground that we that kind of patches into my publishing work and my sort of social world as well. So um um yeah unfortunately I'm not a great there's a terrible thing to say but I listen mostly to all, older music than contemporary sure sure but that's because sure. I'm I'm officially old now so that's okay you can you can, you can show. well i think everybody's thing is uh like their teenage and and early adult years mm -hmm. you know absolutely think, yeah yeah, yeah. It depends i try to forget some of those actually yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think people want to exist in the world in which the cultural world in which they were born so like the so you weren't actually present for it but you want to somehow kind of revisit it as, as an older person. Yeah. Most of the well, music, I have a running joke. I tell people the music died in 1975, which I don't actually <laughs> believe. But. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, tell us about Strange Attractor Press. You, you, you recently had an event, didn't you? Yeah, we have pretty, we have regularly, I mean, we're, we're a tiny book publisher with a, modestly a larger footprint than kind of often appears to be the case but it's essentially myself and Jamie Sutcliffe a, a writer and editor friend we um sort of run it from our office in Shoreditch in East London and we work with a couple of designers regularly to Hannah Sara and uh, Maya Gaffney Hyde um, and then have distribution through MIT Press, who are based in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts. But they are distributed by Penguin Random House, who are based in Crawfordsville, uh, Indiana. So it's quite a strange, <laughs> sprawling, sprawling network. Uh, to Hannah, uh, one of our two main designers, she's in Croatia, in Zagreb, Croatia. So it's quite a kind of uh, network. But yeah, I. I been doing it it'll be 20 years pretty much next year which is oh, kind of congratulations 
Right. Um, we just managed to get off. I'm just looking for it so I can show you, but we just managed to get the fifth edition of what was supposed to be a quarterly journal out, uh, fifth one in, in uh, 20 years. So that's that's good going. But yeah, it began, I actually, it began as a series of events with that John Lumberg and I started up, and that was in what, 2001. Um, and the idea was just to create, you know, in, um, events where you could have less films, um, you know, around a, sp a specific theme. And we did that for a couple of years. John went off to film school and then sort of continuing the story. That's how Mirage Men happened. Um, but I sort of, I was working as a, working at 40 in times amongst other places at the time and um ended up um deciding i was you know i'd rather channel the energy rather than into events which i can never remember a week later even though they were very you know very wonderful <laughs> i'd rather channel them into something that would you know would would persist and survive um as my memory decayed and um and the idea was to create books that were you know were books that would have just as much um interest and relevance in the world you know in a hundred years as they do like we're not really covering current affairs or current events so much as it's often archival or document documentary projects or um you know examining uh, uh themes or cultures or people or events of the of historic uh, that are sort of historic so that um but yeah we're not we're certainly not um not that focused on contemporary matters so i'm just looking around for any of our recent books that are scattered about but yeah we cover the um, recent subjects we did a uh, this anthology which covers everything from what we've got yes so sort of folklore um uh performance uh, a guy it opens with the account of a man joseph de Havilland, who in the late 60s had himself uh crucified with nails on hampstead heath in north london to demonstrate his yogic uh powers mm. of mind over pain um but it was it's quite a complex nuanced story but the unfair part i always think is that while he was not, um, there was some accusation that he was doing it for profit, but that wasn't the case, but ended up with his friends who actually did the nailing um, to the cross um, being charged with grievous bodily harm, which was you know, a, a, a moderate criminal offence, um, even though they were, you know, they were just his um, assistants, right. essentially, right. in the stunt, so... Um, but it's a, super interesting. It ties in with the William Fowler who wrote the piece, who also actually plays in plays uh, bass in Begotten in our band, um, and is uh, an archivist at the British Film Institute and the programmer there. But he ties it in with the emergence of kind of extreme performance art in in the sort of art world. But it's also about the emergence of and acceptance of, of gay culture in Britain, which was sort of in, emerging as a as a sort of culture, or as an acceptable culture. Obviously, it, was, it goes back as far as uh, you know, life on Earth. But um, and uh, yeah, and it's also ties in with emerging popularization of sort of uh, mysticism and and witchcraft and psi powers and things at the time so anyway that's just one story <laughs> in the book but sure. there's, um, there's a whole lot you know there's about 18 pieces in there um just trying to think what else might appeal there's a great piece by the folklorist jeremy hart if you're familiar with him um about um shape-shifting animal spirits and their in in sort of um regional folklore in the uk and how yeah, how they take on different roles and guises in different in, in different environments and different parts of the country. Um, nice piece on Scottish 
folklore and uh, magic and uh, the filmmaker Donald Camel, who made the great film performance. I'm oh, sorry, who, um, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, who made performance in the late 60s with Nicholas Rogue. Um, uh, anyway, there's a, there's a huge amount, but that's all in the journal, which I can't see. We recently published an amazing memoir by a woman called Dorothy Max Pryor, who was a pre and post sort of punk um, performer and sort of um, uh, musician. Well, musician. She was a drummer, uh, a, a, occasionally a singer, but was just a kind of zealot like character who's just sort of just was in all the right places at all the right times and the kind of through from the mid seventies to the sort of mid eighties and just has a really interesting kind of um, slightly distanced queer perspective on what was happening in the, in the emerging sort of music and culture scenes at the time. And there's a huge, it's a, her book binds a lot of the disparate areas of the, pop culture of the time together in a way that everyone always assumes say you know punk happened in a vacuum um disco happened in the vacuum uh performance art happened in a vacuum but really it was all quite a small number of people moving in very similar circles and often bouncing off each other and um collaborating with each other fighting with each other um to you know to produce this kind of whirling foment of of culture, but has all sorts of amazing incidents. And that she ended up being left in charge of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was in London to promote his first film, Pumping Iron. And so she mm. took him to see Adam and the Ants play at a at a gay club in, in London, which he enjoyed very much, apparently. Yeah, um, did you ever see Adam and the Ants? Play? No, I mean Max. That's before author, your time. She was part of. She was kind of it was like absolutely central to their evolution to the band's development, and in fact, most of the book is very upbeat and um, kind of um, celebratory. But the only chapter that's kind of sad and a little bit depressing is the chapter on Adam and the Ants. It's how something that began joyously and and full of kind of hope and optimism and energy just became through, unfortunately, through mental uh, illness, essentially, uh, of of Stuart Adam. Oh, shoot. It okay. became something very twisted and kind of narcissistic and, and quite sort of dark. Mm. But those are people who went along with it, you know, um, it, it, it made some people, you know, relatively well extremely famous and and wow. quite uh probably quite wealthy and and successful but at a price i would say but um anyway so that's another one but yes yeah we we, we publish a huge a huge m many more books than an imprint uh, sorry a publishing house of our size should and yeah apparently yeah yeah well you've um kind of created a rod for our own backs with it so we're <laughs> having to to peel back a little bit and we also cover i mean we do actually something that might will definitely be of interest um to you guys is um which is quite late but we're publishing the first um monograph first collection of artworks by um ional talpazan if you came across him the romanian american artist who died i think about seven or eight years ago who um fled romania under the ceausescu mm. regime eventually got to new york in the mid 80s and was you know, more or less destitute but would had a um so transcendental encounter that through time became a kind of alien ufo encounter mm. and he just drew hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of paintings and drawings of flying saucers there, um, pro propulsion systems with sort of bits of uh, 
the information that he'd received about the occupants and the um, and the sort of science behind the propulsion, which he would just re you know, just repeatedly, repeatedly draw in a way, almost trying to exercise the experience from himself. I have never heard of him um, before. He's, he was very oh. he was well known if you spent time in the flea markets of New York and actually my friend um you know who you might know so Fortean writer and um Renaissance man he and now John Keel's archivist as well but he um gave me one of them in the late 90s which I still have over my desk but wow of course once yeah that you could buy them for a few bucks at that time and, and now that he's no longer with us his artworks are traded for vast amounts of money by large galleries and art collectors um but a, um a sort of cultural historian called daniel uh Wojciech in um where is he i have temporarily forgotten which university he's at i want to say detroit but i'll have to check um but he spent many hours interviewing Talpazan when he was alive. So he's and has a collection of his work. So he's uh, sort of compiling this into a book for us. Which just want to check. Oh, we can check where where Daniel's um, stationed. But I can't. I can't remember. Fascinating. You've already uh, taught me so much. Well, in twenty minutes, like I'm excited to, to I'm get done with the interview and look into this. <laughs> But um, no, the, it is. If I say so myself, we off, we problem is we're so nose to tail putting the books out that we often don't get time to step back and actually look at what we've done. And every now and again, like now, when I start to think, oh, I think all the <laughs> we actually do do some incredible books. We did. You didn't. Yeah, you might enjoy. You should be proud of it. Yeah. Um, oh, it's very. Yeah, it, it is fantastic. Um, we did a really amazing book on Hawkwind, the British sort of space rock band that was like a examination of the sort of cultural factors in Britain and in sort of science fiction literature and things that kind of fed into the creation of Hawkwind and its and their mythology as well as being about the band and and their records. That's that's been very popular. So the first, well, it's not the first, but it's, um. Yeah, it's sort of, uh, pro maybe the, the sort of first cultural history of Hawkwind, shall we say, but um, anyway. But, um, and we try and do, I, you know, I like to keep 40 in books in the mix as well, because that's sort of where my heart is really, but, and that's, and it's just getting the balance right with, when you're engaging with, for, for me, engaging with 40 in material, we're not, um, so um i don't know we did christopher joseph's fantastic uh biography of jeff the talking mongoose which came out about eight years ago um and you know it's um both yeah you know, we like things that can be both scholarly and weird and funny at the same time i think that's the best way yeah it's how we like to approach 40 material and that stems really from my kind of uh time with that 40 and times and 40 and times magazine which kind of continues that tradition i think very well that that does kind of transition us a little into the the ufos and the paranormal mm -hmm. and um someone can can look you know a, a simple internet search of you and your work and they can see over time that you you've long had an interest in the esoteric and the, the 40 and and so as you began to um dive deeper into ufos and and uh, you, you might be best known for mirage men and as you came to write that and work on that were you surprised, disappointed? Um, wh what kind of thoughts and emotions did you have about the extent of shenanigans that you were seeing going on? Um, I wasn't surprised because I that was one of the sort of areas I was 
particularly interested in in the subject and that's kind of how how i got involved really as the sort of writer as it was it was an area i was quite you know, had limited familiarity with but yeah the the sort of further this the it's hard to say i mean i had been in a way that i'm not now i just can't be but um but i was for quite a while i was through the sort of late 80s to the mid 90s i was i would say i was pretty deeply immersed in the ufo lore and that was quite a good time <laughs> to be immersed in it because there was a lot of it um and it was um kind of more filtered than it is now and that you had to just you know wait you had a little you know uh air breaks uh between the like the, the drops of information you had to wait for a book to come out or a zine to be published it wasn't just this constant yeah go to mind. conferences or yeah that's a yeah. Constant yeah. bombardment or conferences whatever yeah you just didn't have this constant um flow of of kind of um unstoppable information that we have now um <laughs> but i went you know as with everybody i went through my teenage um when just sort of optimistic i would say phase rather you know slightly naive probably optimistic phase then went into the the you know, early 90s was interesting because it, there was a definite shift from the kind of more you know it began for me with timothy good and above top secret which was very much old school 50s nuts and bolts kind of you know material it was just only about the physical material reality of flying source and things and then through the 90s i think re also reflecting things going on in the wider culture it got a little bit more esoteric and a bit more about the intersections of consciousness and alien intelligences and um you know um um more it, it opened up into a more kind of paranormal psychical research so metaphysical field i would say which was, was suited my interest um uh, and then you kind of by the mid 90s it was all about the conspiracy um but that also coincided with the, you know, the huge explosion of of interest through x files and independence day and all that thing so i kind of flowed through that trajectory but the stuff that but yeah, I suppose for me, I went on a reverse trajectory just as all of that was taking off. I was starting to, yeah, become much less, much more skeptical in a sort of Fortean way and, and much less um, focused on, you know, are we being visited by aliens or other non-human intelligences and much more into the kind of meta story which is the one that you know jack as well you've done amazing uh work with but starting to look at you know the who was benefiting from the um from the ufo stories that were being told who were the people that kept telling them and kept repeating them look trying to follow the kind of uh flows of themes and patterns and um repeating ideas and see where they came from so taking i suppose more of a cultural historian's approach and a folklorist approach and i was very inspired in that by a really important british zine that was operating from the 1960s and still exists online called magonia which was it took a sort of folkloric uh, attitude towards the subject and that was really my kind of that was my real uh schooling i think was sort of meeting in the pub once a month with with uh, john rimmer and um john harney and and various others to kind of pick apart just uh, apply folkloric kind of uh thinking to 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 the subject and people like the great martin cotmeyer who is an american and as an american writer he was a regular contributor so it's actually something I'd like to do, which John Rimmer is quite resistant to, is to kind of try to create an anthology of Magonia that I think would be a really important learning, as so a re educational and inspirational research and for, uh, resource for sort of the new uh, sort of UFO researchers. But 
Um, one of the things, and excuse me if I feel like I'm just sort of ricocheting around on the <laughs> subject, but I mean, one of the things that becomes really apparent, and I think is is is, is important in um, um, understanding the subject is how, as with many, you know, cultural areas, it just cycles and it kind of you know reinvents the wheel every couple of decades so that you end up kind of back where you started and it feels like it can be difficult to feel that things are nudging forwards in any way that those of us who've been involved in it for longer might feel is helpful and you certainly and, and that can be somewhat dispiriting I'm sure you find both find that yeah yeah like for instance um when this Pentagon UFO story broke in, in 2017, and there was a lot of hype about that, some of the more experienced people were of the opinion of, you know, well, let, let's see what, what can be verified, what evidence do people bring, you, you know, let, let's, let's focus on facts here. We've seen this song and dance before about congressional hearings and um, getting military people to talk. We, we've seen this every 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And understandably, newer people kind of feel like, Shut up, old man. If you mm -hmm. knew anything, there wouldn't be 70 years of wheel spinning. So yeah. step aside and, and, and let us yeah. have a shot. And that's particularly ironic that they viewed the new brigade as people with names like Hal Putoff and Eric Davis. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's um, I mean, also, that's, you know, one of the benefits of again being in the world for long as you you can just see the same figures appearing over and over again. I don't know if you know, I mean, it's pretty old now. Um, um, Adam Curtis's film "The Power of Nightmares" from the early so it was two thousand and four or so, but it it basically off the top of my head. it's uh, it's it's it was a um, a sort of examination of um, the war on terror, I suppose. But one of the things that always was just incredible with that was seeing how the same characters keep appearing behind the scene. It's over decades. Oh, we yeah, you know, Donald Donald Rumsfeld was the was the classic, but they are, they they are basically the the, the power behind the influencing machine or the the the, th the throne, if you like, um, through sort of generations of of presences. And you see the same in the UFO field. The same, yeah. You know, the Invisible College keeps um, keeps kind of popping up, and I and perhaps surprising or unusually, I don't I actually don't you know i don't i don't see this as any kind of conspiracy or so sort of sinister attempt to sort of uh sort of stage manage you know the the phenomenon or anything like that i think it's just um you know they will they the the light so sort of shines the the spotlights are often turned to people like you know kit green jack valley uh how put off eric davis less so he's he's a sort of more of a uh behind so backstage guy but um obviously um um robert bigelow's you know that, that's a i'd say i'd categorize him slightly differently uh <laughs> if i if i was to be honest but uh because there is some he's yeah he's like the sort of rupert murdoch of the ufo world i'd say um but um yeah it's um it's helpful to have to have a bit of in life as you know it's helpful to have a bit of hindsight but it's particularly i think important to encourage people interested in 
that you know in the contemporary uh, kind of ufological tumult to look at the history and see you know see the cycles um repeating themselves and see how as you say jack you know these the congressional hearings or large um you know very um uh, a sort of um audience aware um invest you know congressional reports and things uh, will will appear when they are needed um so so to misquote charles fort you know it's um you get steam engines when it's steam engine time and you'll get congressional reports when it's congressional reports time um but um yeah i i think i mean my as i know with you jack you know um i'm i'm almost entirely um yeah almost entirely uninterested in ufo sightings themselves now i'm just really interested in um you know the thing well the inter the inter how things are into how events are interpreted and received and then kind of ripple out into the into the culture what interests me but the sightings themselves you know they i don't think they've got any more interesting <laughs> as in, as events over time which is not to in any way belittle people are reporting their sightings i think it's very important that people do try to document their sightings and if you're lucky enough to have one it's a you know it can be a thrilling a thrilling event like seeing you know seeing a whale when you're on a boat or you know other sort of um you know seeing a, a wolf cross your trail in in the woodlands or something you know they're they are thrilling uh encounters but um i am more yes just sort of more interested in the, the meta you know the meta story i suppose now which is um is i think through the work of you know yourselves and i'm very encouraged to there's a, a sort of new or new to me anyway generation of researchers a handful of people that have seemed to be really um finding those interesting kind of paths through the through the stories and through the material and and just about you know we've tried to pull the curtain open a tiny tiny crack and there are now people working out how they can just get it open a little bit more it will never be fully pulled back but you know uh, um and a lot of people are writing up you know um as a guy who i've exchanged a little bit with called tano boyle who's been doing really super interesting deep dives into things like the gulf breeze six and um you know bosco nedelchovic who I mentioned in mirage men and actually you know taking the small slither of available information and just managing just to widen it a little bit further just by doing being you know knowing just through research essentially and good archive delving and things like that but um yeah that's i think um we want more you know more of that and less of shouting at fuzzy dots on on on, on to, you know on youtube <laughs> which seems sure. to be what sure. people want to do but um well like you said mark that um you you didn't think there was a a grand conspiracy like you didn't think that that people i assume you mean government officials are trying to um, manage the phenomenon um, an argument could be made that, uh, that there, there are certain groups from the American government that may not really be much more interested in UFO reports than you and I are, that see financial opportunities, see opportunities for research grants, corporations mm -hmm. to get funding. It, is that what you were getting at? Yeah. I think that's i think that is what we are seeing going on in the current climate i think um i'm i'm sort of hesitant for 
um, reasons I, I should have discussed uh, before we started, but I, I won't go to, yeah, I think broadly speaking, we are seeing a very, what's I think a very interesting kind of, you know, dance between, um, yeah, um, private technological and military technology development, development companies and corporations. Yeah, the defense industry, um, the the sort of uh, intelligence field, um, private scientific researchers, commercial scientific researchers, entertainment companies, um, you know, attendant kind of fleet of grifters and charlatans, they're all kind of just you know, so spiraling in the, in the, around wow. each other in the oceans and, and out of this, uh, you know, it's a, it's a so complex, you know, it's like a sort of net, it's a network essentially. And, you know, you don't know how one intersection of, um, you know, a cable TV company and a, um, you know, and a, um, whatever it might be, a, 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 a satellite defense, um, so de com a developer might then result in, you know, a, um, yeah, result, result in sudden appearance of pyramids floating in, in night vision over, a, you know, over a fuzzy background, whatever it is. But point being, we're just, it's just this kind of, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a quite a complex mesh, I would say of, you know, uh, uh, um, yeah, it's, I call it sometimes the, um, um, um yes yeah, so, uh sorry just had a mind fog then um this, yeah the military entertainment complex i suppose is is yeah, the one way of yeah. thinking about it um where and also you know this is interesting in the way that um which it goes you know goes way back and jack you talk about it i talk about it in Mirishman, you know, the influence that um, uh, sort of um, political groups and uh, intelligence groups and the sort of spaces between those had how they were able to influence you know, Hollywood uh, films going you know, way back to the 40s and 50s. And nowadays, if you're making a huge blockbuster and you need to have some kind of you know, military uh, presence involved, your script will be vetted and managed, you know, by the public relations people. And they're that, happy you know, to do um, it. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll do it. That's oh, fine. You know, and, but I think that's what we're seeing. You know, that again, I sort of think the UFO, the sort of popular, the sort of audience end of the UFO culture is essentially a, a kind of managed entertainment um, <laughs> uh, sort of project managed. Managed partly by uh, the, you know, the, the defense industries and um, and their public relations kind of uh, and it's just a public relations exercise for the defense industry, shall we say? Um, and I don't. The defense industry is not just one thing. It's kind of again another mesh of um, businesses and corporations and individuals and researchers and all the rest. Um, yes, yes. Well, there's a uh, speaking of cycles repeating the um, investigative journalist and editor Sharon Weinberger wrote a nonfiction book called Imaginary Weapons that that's uh, I would recommend to people that are interested in the ATIP and the OSAP story and that uh, she took a deep dive into uh, DARPA funded projects with uh, some supposed experts that were supposed to be doing uh, weapons research and development for a hafnium bomb. And 
somewhat like the Bigelow crew, the, these, or at least it was reminiscent to me, the, these researchers um, considered themselves pretty much above reproach and the only people qualified to do the research. And so uh, they, they started getting criticized and some were outright calling them charlatans for taking grant funds and falsifying experiments that could not be reproduced and things like this. Uh, but their argument was other people just didn't understand how to do it and weren't as qualified as they were. But uh, ultimately, uh, DARPA spent a lot of money and got no hafnium bomb uh, out of the circumstance. Yeah. But I mean, I think, you know, what, yeah, the, the sort of, um, again, so it's yeah, defense industry lobbying is really central to this, and part of that is, you know, um, maintaining the threat is always going to be central to the success of the defense industry, and if that threat, you know, um, if 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 there isn't a threat, you'll have to start thinking of new ones and. You know, I think the my my sense is that um, for the most part, you know, the the defense establishments, the intelligence establishments, they pretty much know what's going on most of the time in this, you know, in the skies and in the oceans. And every now and again, obviously, there's a surprise. Someone comes up with something new or unexpected, or that slips. It, it somehow manages to kind of get slipped through the gaps. Um, but um, you've got to maintain the, the threat of the unknown, you know, even when you do know that when you do know, you know, almost everything that's going on, there's always going to be the, the, the black swan, you know, the unknown thing that might creep through, but it's also important to amplify that. And um, if other people are doing that amplification for you, you know, in the UFO field, then you can certainly try to take something that may seem non-credible, you know, increase its credibility, and then you can increase its viability as a <laughs> as a funding stream, I suppose. Um, and so, you know, it's been really um, again very interesting to just look at the passage of the current upsurge in the UFO story, you know, that basically begins in the, what, 2000, um, when did, whenever To The Stars Academy began, then you had the New York Times uh, stories like 2017, you had the, the yeah. Tic Tacs and the Nimitz stories emerging. And this was, you know, I think it was, um, yeah, that was it. Was it was clearly choreographed, but it was something that had not had had been a few attempts to kickstart it and kind of jumpstart it over the years that hadn't worked out. Like the um, Nimitz footage was first drifting around message boards in what two thousand and seven was it, and nobody deemed it <laughs> worthy of, worthy of note. So it took another ten years really for for the right ducks to get in a row or the, you know, the right uh, pelicans to yeah get get presented in the right manner yeah yeah exactly yeah. and that's that's again it's it's a sort of um it's it's just about um against public relations sort of um marketing just finding the finding the right moment sort of catching catching the wave at the at the right moment getting the right people lined up to um work with you but there is you know it's unquestionable that um um the same again the same characters um keep keep appearing in the storyline and yeah you know, and um yeah there was some crossover with Weinberger's book and some names that I recognized from UFO circles yeah mm -hmm. there were 
Um, speaking of, you, you, you mentioned that they probably have a pretty good idea what's going on in the sky. I, I certainly agree with that uh, about what they care about. They, they're, they're aware. Mm-hmm. Speaking of, um, do you care to give us a take on our Chinese visitor that just floated sure. through? Yeah, what an amazing story and what a great UFO. It's a kind of perfect UFO story in the sense of the response. Yeah, I think the different responses to it. And the first question that when I read about it, the first, well, the first thing that I was, that caught my attention was actually the suggestion that there's technology on them that can sort of slightly steer the balloons and direct them, which I, you know, was news to me and I think is actually new technology has to do with navigating through um, you know, jet streams at, at a very high altitude. And I suspect the the kind of array underneath it, perhaps that can rotate in some way that would then help steer the balloon. But the first thing that really crossed my mind is this is just like a a faint. It's like a it's like a misdirection, surely. Um, and you know, the, whoever in there's some suggestion that it wasn't even that it, it's a it reflects some kind of tensions between different parts of the Chinese kind of uh, government and military um, sort of orders, but. Whoever, whether it's an official government release or some kind of um, um, breakaway, uh, so military uh, release, it was seems to be designed to distract attention from something else. Well, that's what that's what um, struck me. Um, but um, you know, something that can be tracked very easily over its entire flight path is not really going to be that useful as a as as an in, as a sort of a clandestine intelligence gathering device. You know, and I have to say before we started the show that you know you mentioned this, and I I that brought back so many memories. I've been talking to Jack about about a case I investigated when I was state director for MUFON, and there I got a call from Fox News one Thursday or Friday afternoon. Oh my gosh, about eight years ago, I think. And, you know, they were seeing, they were getting reports from people that were sending in photographs and videos that were standing in the Salt Lake Valley looking up at the sky. And they were seeing five to seven spherical objects that were hovering in place over, Mm -hmm. you know, the valley for an extended period of time. And there were reports. I started getting into social media and then contacting people that were posting the reports and interviewed uh, different people, went to different locations. And, one thing that had happened is it, they allegedly shut down the powers that be shut down or diverted flight traffic from the Salt Lake International Airport because these objects were flying about the same altitude, 60,000 feet um, in unison right over the flight corridor of, of the International Airport. And for people that know Utah, we've also got Dugway Proving Ground. We have some very sensitive spaces here in Utah. And so what a NSA, interesting thing. Yeah. Right, the NSA. They went right over the NSA uh, complex out in Bluffdale, which was uh, fascinating. But I got together with um, a couple of people and, and decided I wanted to do a FOIA request. And it was really interesting because the next day the objects were reported by a man, Matt Renew, who worked for a station over in Colorado and had witnessed, interviewed police and tried to contact NORAD and all sorts of, of different things. And he, he was, you know, he got nothing about it. But we did do a FOIA request for radar data, and when we got it back twice, it was unreadable text format. And then when I had a different case that came through a couple years after that, which was another pretty interesting case that had a lot to do, I'm sure, with our own technology, but we sent it to Martin Schaff over in in England again, and he was able to determine there were, in fact, uh, fighter jets that were in the area, a significant number of them during that time period, which correlated to what witnesses were saying that these objects were there and there were they were being accompanied, you know, by by military uh, mm. jets, fighter jets. And so that was really interesting. And when I put that into MUFON, I mean, here you've got daylight sightings, you've got photo, you've got photos, videos, all of these things. It's like, okay, this seems to me like this would be a pretty interesting sighting. And the the powers that be said, oh, these are Google loon balloons. 
And so, of course, I, being the spirited last that I am, contacted. Um, and there's my little delivery outside the door. But I contacted. Hang on, Jack. You've got to take over because I've got it. Sorry, right during my story. Hang on. Right in your this. story. Yeah. On, I know. Dang it. Hang on one second. Uh, it's um, also. In, I suddenly realized that just a matter of what three days before the Chinese balloon made the news headline weren't um, Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp um, promoting a satellite photograph of what they, was they were they, they, and the sorry guys, it was a special okay. delivery <laughs> <laughs> sorry about um, that it was pretty important. I don't think I'm not sure that they yeah you know, whether they were they're now being um, courted by the Chinese intelligence services to, to but you're them, right they have been room. trying to gin up another round of look what leak that uh, I haven't really put a pencil to it um, you know, I like we say, you, you've got to have the stamina and the time and all of that. But Erica, you were saying you did the FOIA request. Right. Yeah. For me, and again, I'm sorry, that was just perfect timing. You know, I'm telling you, but I um, did the FOIA request. We got that information back. And then when I was putting it forward to different people who I would have thought would have run you know, with this, oh my Lord, this is, you know, we've got these interesting objects, people are seeing things and they were telling me they were Google loon balloons. And when I reached out to the FAA and, and, and other people, there were no Google loon balloons that were flying in America at, at that time at all. They were down in South America. And so there were all these inconsistencies with things. And I don't even think they were launching that many at a time during that time period anyway. And so what was that? Was that our technology that we were testing out? Was that an adversary? But they remarkably, I mean, they were remarkably similar to what we saw mm -hmm. that just floated over our country. So and what, fascinating. What period was this, Erica? No, I want to think that this was back in 2016. Okay. But I will go back and check. It's really, if you go to uh, YouTube and you Google uh, mass daytime sighting, in Colorado, you'll see some of the footage and the reporting of Matt Renew. It's really interesting. Because um, one of the things that's emerged and is a sort of um, was a kind of, re a sort of um, rebuttal to people often photographed waving machine guns into the air, he said that yeah, the, the, the balloon should have been shot down. Um, the government, US government, uh, released information that's at least, I think it was at least three of these balloons flew over the US during the previous um, president's uh, term, which would fit in just about with what you're describing and, and didn't make, were not covered at all in the news for, um, for, re you know, for whatever reason they, they uh, it was, it was decided. Um, um, but you have to assume that yeah, we well, we know, um, you know, that every nation that can is sending satellites over um, each other's countries, uh, you know, whenever they can afford to. So it's not as if there aren't plenty of, you know, intelligence gathering systems busy, sort of clicking away at photographs. Twenty four seven, three sixty five. Yeah, yeah. So whether this was again just trolling of some sort on a kind of you know international level or a distraction or trying to pick up you know maybe some kind of sensory data that that can't be collected from satellites who knows but um i guess that's now what's what um the people who've the recovery team are going to start working out from the from the source but it's interesting just to think about you know the number of very clear images that were captured of the of the object and i know that people were able to plot its trajectory and you know you could be ready and waiting with a high powered camera if you knew what you were doing but even you know the initial photographs and the shots of it being uh photograph video of it being shot down things were just taken by ordinary people on their largely on cell phones and things and were of workable quality so it does raise interesting questions in relation to, you know, UFO footage, which hasn't got any better. Um, the fakes have got better, but the, the genuine footage hasn't really improved in any way. Yeah. And every now and again, I will see a news headline, the, the most astounding 
you know UFO footage ever taken. I go, okay, great, have a look. And it's three more <laughs> you know, white lights against a black background. Okay, yeah. I've seen that one before. Come on. <laughs> but well, you know, in comparison, the, the, the this story and also the reception of it in the news. Um, you know, again, it what there was no there wasn't really an attempt to sensationalize it it was just here's the information it's a, it's a satellite intelligence gathering balloon here's where it's traveling here's where it's going here's what the government's doing so in just seeing that it, the, the the reporting of this event which is a, you know which is a significant hi historic event um how that compares to the just constant clouds of uh, sensationalism and and ultimately obfuscation that are kicked up around any time the UFO story makes the headlines. It was an interesting kind of com comparison um, to make. Um, but also, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm rattling on again. Um, but you know, and again, in the history of UFOs, the spherical UFO is is one of my sort of favourites, and they they sort of crop up going right back to the kind of pulp science fiction days um through to um you know the, the, they were they were a common theme in in the kind of uh, abduction era um so it's nice to kind of yeah see the see the spheres returning yeah 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 um it, like if we were and to see a nice saucer that that would be interesting yeah, as yeah, well on the but, this, if you remember the NASA Echo Satellites, that these that were absolutely incredible sized, perfect kind of metallic pinballs that would sort of hover in the it, it just sort of in the um, outer edges of the atmosphere and were kind of uh, radar um, radar balloons. You know that they were to me were the perfect UFO, and I'm sure I would have accounted for some UFO sightings as well. So these you know these are recurring themes and of course the metallic spheres that were used in electronic countermeasures so floating down on on um, parachutes to kind of deflect radar signals from um, during you know heightened uh, encounters in the cold war and the thing and actually the what um is it in the Nimitz encounter they describe cubes inside spheres or something as one of the kind of objects that are seen hovering around the aircraft carrier so again all things that seem reminiscent of, of, of yeah what yeah um something that comes to mind to me as well is uh going all the way back to the mid 20th century but e even in recent years it's just hard to envision that that ufo organizations do not play a role in intelligence collection to, to some degree. I mean, uh, the, the experience Erica shared, even at a personal level, I have had sources at varying levels of, of the food chain in MUFON um, tell me that they were under the impression that the board and the system was compromised and that there were people that, that it, it was just kind of part of the, the deal was that if suits with badges showed up, you turn something over. And uh, I, I, I feel like Erica's experience that she kind of supports that. And on just a common sense level, it just stands to reason that if people are, are taking pictures around Pensacola Air Base or, or whatever, that that those are going to attract more attention from the powers that be and who's interested in those pictures and if if somebody tells mufon we need you to pull that report those are the kind of things i got for years from like i say a variety of sources informing me that things just disappear that, that certain mm -hmm. reports just get removed and uh, now to kind of take this full circle, when the ATIP story finally broke and it became apparent that Robert Bigelow had been acting as a conduit 
for DIA funds and um, acting as a liaison between MUFON and the Defense Intelligence Agency. It, it was kind of ironic to me that all of these conspiracy theories, to some extent, got supported by that. You, you know, we had heard for years people saying the feds are running MUFON, and then like, well, okay, I guess they are. <laughs> I mean, I guess the, you know, following on from your own amazing research into NICAP, you know, has there ever been a American UFO organization that wasn't essentially run by the run by the feds? I would think almost certainly not, to be honest. Or some one that had made any inroads into the you know into the field or into the into the culture, um, and certainly. Uh, interesting thinking about NICAP and how it's one of those in cases where those of us who were aware of the influx of CIA and NSA and X intelligence sort of pe people into NICAP, even you know, you'd just be telling yourself, oh, that yeah, it's perfectly reasonable for them to be interested in <laughs> in this material, but you know, of course. <laughs> Yeah, of course it it wasn't. <laughs> it was, right, uh, you're right. kind of making making excuses or apolog apologizing for your thinking in these in, in these cases. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it does raise the important question of can you know could could someone and there's something I've occasionally thought about. How would you go about? starting from scratch a kind of ufo or research organization that worked with new technologies worked with you know um all the sort of live information and communications systems that exist work with all the you could you know you could essentially have a, a kind of permanent um ufo so sort of tracking <laughs> service going on that but that could also have a a deeply ethic, you know, have an ethical and transparent um, core to it, so that you know people who submit information know what's, you know, what's happening to it, know what, you know, who will be given access to their files. There'll be data protection, um, you know, um, laws worked into it. It would be a, it, it would be an interesting thing for someone not probably not one of us to, to um, well, consider. I do have to give a shout out to aerial phenomena investigation. Hmm. Um, right? Yeah. Erica has interviewed Paul Carr who uh, directs their organization and it's a, it's small. It, it's not a, you know, dozens of people uh, type of thing. Um, and, uh, he he does good work. He he has a small team that carefully takes reports and examines them and works on them to the extent that the witnesses uh, will agree and uh, has a very ethical standard for uh, releasing personal information or not. Um, so, yes, there are some, as I'm sure you would both agree, there are some ethical people with transparency, but no, when you get into large organizations that uh, are um, courting um, politicians in Washington and things like that, it, it, it gets hard to stay out of the favor trading business, it mm -hmm. appears. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just have to really quickly, because I, down the rabbit hole wants me to ask this question. And so I want to make sure I do that for him. He was wondering, uh, Mark, how you think disclosure of aliens visiting our planet would affect the stock market? By disclosure, I mean POTUS announces aliens are visiting visiting our planet. Um, I I would have to, you, I think it would have to be a rally, you know, people, um, the, the, every, all of the things that people think they can profit from energy, um, you know, resources, um, information, entertainment, would, the hope would be there would be a lot more of that where <laughs> where the aliens come from. Um, and one interesting, you know, I, I, I like that question because all too often that's always been a question, the question of disclosure is all too often framed around religious beliefs or 
you know, the sort of um, ontological crisis that might be um, triggered by you know, realizing that we're, um, you know, that there are people or there are beings other than ourselves out there, but you know, to frame it on a, on a like that is, is uh, welcome. Um, I mean, on the one of the interesting um, sort of surveys probably about a decade or so ago where a number of uh, sort of senior members uh, as now would um, uh, the, the, the announcement of extraterrestrial life impact your religion um, all of them um, I think except the be a good thing would be <laughs> would sorry be, you just broke up really quickly there so what was the last sentence sorry it's just that uh, none of the none of the major religious organizations who were contacted and I, I can't remember the date of the poll but it was uh, probably about 10 years ago um all of them said that they would be very happy to hear the news of you know of, of disclosure of extraterrestrial existence and that it would they would you know they would welcome the newcomers as members of you know of as um you know children of of whichever faith that they uh, were part of there was no point being there was no sense that it would create any kind of friction or tension or or, or um you know discomfort for any of the major religious movements so it's nice to re to frame things in, in a new way but um yeah um i don't um yeah i mean i, I, I the phrase disclosure i sort of now I, I associate solely with the kind of um the sort of millenarian sort of sort of religious movement really rather than with an, any notion of a, of a of a kind of revelation and it's you know um when people talk about disclosure they only want disclosure of the thing they want to hear about which is you know the the uh, long-running conspiracy to cover up the the, the truth of uh, extraterrestrial contact and visitation but you know just over the last two decades or so many of the you know uh world's governments and militaries have actually disclosed their ufo files and all of them have just uh revealed the apparent truth that uh they they don't have much more of a sense of what's going on than anybody else does um even though they have in yeah you know, they have uh, better equipment and facilities you know when it comes to the unknowns they remain unknown yeah, they, um, and there can be many reasons for that obviously so disclosure you know has has happened it just didn't disclose what the people um, canvassing for disclosure want and, and so i've got to ask you too because you know with mirage man i mean i i watched it again for the 50th time last night. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful documentary. And just to listen to some of the things that these people were saying at the conferences and to see how, you know, like your Linda Moulton house to see Richard Doty and to see the usual suspects who are promoting things. I mean, do you think that they honestly believed what they were saying or do you? Um, so very, I think Linda Moulton how is is um yeah i think she's gen yeah i think she is genuine um yeah i i wouldn't say i would you know i would um say i don't necessarily um believe all the things that she says myself but i think she probably does and 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 certainly um is is i don't think she's disingenuous personally um person i sort of yeah and richard doty we just don't <laughs> we just don't know <laughs> right um, it's too it's it's you know we spent a lot of time wondering this um the four of us and we are now closer to understanding what goes on uh in 
Rick's mind than anybody. I mean, one of, one of the things, if we're talking about Rick, Richard Doty, Rick, the thing that surprised me the most of ever, of anything I've seen in the past few years was to see Rick um, being welcomed in, with open arms into the kind of uh, UFO entertainment industry. And he is a, you know, he, he should be a, you know, a personality within that world, but not, but for different, <laughs> for different reasons. I would say. Um, um, but there was a great, a photograph that, again, if there was ever to be He's another. He's so polite, isn't he? The way he, he words this. Yeah. <laughs> if there were ever another edition of Mirage Man, there's a great photograph, which I kept of Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. Uh, and Rick Doty in the middle, and they're all sort of laughing and <laughs> you know new best friends. And I just think, well, they, you've got uh, you've got what you need there. Um, but I don't, I don't. It's really hard, you know. Who? One of the things that's a consistent theme when you're dealing with, um, you know, with these kind of areas of whatever. Fortiana, paranormal, anomalous experience or, or culture, UFOs, is that um, so often you are relying on witness testimony, uh, on, mem on memory, on um, ident you know, pe identity, people's sort of sense of identity, so many things that are so constantly fluid and and in flux and malleable and changeable that are always that we assume are you know we always assume that our identities are fixed our memories are fixed our the, the things we see and experience are fixed but they're not they're just constantly flowing and unless you actually capture the things right then and there write them down um you know if you've got a means to capture them with film or photographs or or audio, you know, you're you have no way of guaranteeing that the thing you remember, even two weeks later, is the thing that actually happened. And that's you know, time and time and time again, um, yeah, demonstrated through um, you know, through all these all these fields. But we are working in areas where, or exploring areas where people are having extraordinary experiences that and then once you move into the you know into these kind of either transcendental or or um shocking or or sort of life-changing experiences again then there's a whole new world of complications that enter into it that are again bound to people's sense of self and identity their relationship to the world their relationship to other people and it just gets very, very complex. You can't, ex there, there, are, there, there are no kind of straightforward um, stories being told once you sort of enter into that um, realm of experience. And I, I you know, I, I personally did wonder, I think, I know that Linda Mon Howe's mind was blown, you know, back in the 19, late 1970s by her encounters with Rick Doty, essentially, and the and the um, deception, you know, materials of deception that were sort of passed to her. But I also wonder. I do genuinely wonder if, at some point, Rick's mind was uh, blown by something he was shown, perhaps as part of a, another deception, you know, within within the world, the you know, intelligence world that he was uh, operating in at the time. Um, so um yeah i mean i don't know and one one thing and i know you've said this as well jack but my experience of going to larger ufo events which i've you know, been to a few over the years is that they would benefit I, you know if you had a local um university or or medical school nearby there, it would be helpful to everybody to actually get um, either trainee or and and sort of experienced uh, psychologists and psychiatrists down onto the you know 
in mixing with the crowd and just being present and being available for people to talk to and um you know and everyone would i think uh some of the people i for a while i was a sort of active actively engaged with research and and um investigations going back a long way and yeah, all, all too often you just meet people and you'd say i'm I, you know you need a kind of help that i can't offer and i'm not trained to offer and i would you know ask you to think about <laughs> helping yourself in this way and again at ufo uh conferences that's something yeah, that happens quite regularly and you just it's it's it would be wonderful if you were able to say well there's a stall over there people who are you know trained um either psychiatric or, or therapeutic professionals who can ha you know who are interested in anomalous experiences or transcendental experiences or you know whatever you want to call them and would you know can talk to you in a way that make you feel that you're a, a, you know that there's something wrong or that you're a outsider or a weirdo or whatever and i think uh, it would it would be, i think there's a lack of, it's changing a bit and there are of course um departments and universities in this country and um and elsewhere who are starting to seriously study anomalous experiences and the sort of psychology and psychiatry of them but i think you you need people on the ground at these events who can be there to listen and advise and help um because otherwise you know you give a talk at an event and you know someone who's perhaps not well who's had or has you know um perhaps minor delusional psychosis or what have you will attach onto something that you've said and think that you can help them and you know and you'll end up having a long and interesting exchange or conversation with someone but you ultimately can't help them other than to try and reassure them that everything's okay um so anyway, I, that's something as, as a kind of um, coming back to this question of, you know, um, what's what's going on in people in some of these, you know, some people's minds when they are presenting or, or um, sharing their experiences, I think, you know, it would be beneficial to everybody to get some professionals <laughs> involved. Um, and this is not in any way a shorthand for saying people are you know anyone's crazy i'm just saying um that there are categories of experiences that people have that don't fit into you know um the mundane characters of experience uh, 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 categories of experience that you know most of us engage with or think about and it would be good to have people around who understand these you know far more puzzling and and overwhelming and and um confusing experiences um, yeah, it's a wonderful idea i think that and, and and to me that was one of the alarming things uh you know that i saw going to conferences was the fact that you did have people there that that really did need help and yet you know they, they were in the the meditation or the experience or uh workshop at 7 a.m every morning being hypnotized and told that they're, you know, benevolent, they're being, they're in contact with benevolent space beings. And so any shred of, of trying to get that person the help they need is completely gone. And to me, that's, it's really almost bordering on criminal to see that type of, of behavior and to see people that are really good people looking for answers to questions who, you know, need help go down that rabbit hole. And I have to say, you know, at what point in time do the people that are sponsoring the conferences and the people that are highlighting the speaking at the conferences, at what point in time do they step up and say, hey, we're not okay with this? There's never been, uh, in my opinion, looking back at the history of the subject, there's never been any, uh, no, there are no ethics. You know, nobody has, there, there are no guidelines. There's no working together. It's just giving people that have outlandish thoughts and delusional, you know, ideology, a platform to go out and spew crap and really offer other people, I mean, a, a real opportunity to have a breakdown. And so to me, that really is, and I appreciate you bringing that up because that's something that's bothered me for a, a long time. Yeah. And that's, um, 
you know, you talk about that so very eloquently in your writing, Jack, as well. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks to both of you. I, I think it's an important conversation and an, an important topic to address that, uh, yeah, in my opinion, the, the challenges that Erica mentioned are not coincidental. Uh, there, there are, um, especially in the 1980s, 1990s, bleeding into the 2000s, there were self-proclaimed experts in alien abduction that uh, I, I feel pretty confident part of their method of operation was to blur the lines between whether they're conducting an investigation or whether they are um, having some kind of therapeutic role with an individual. And to some extent, I think that we still see this going on in certain MUFON experiencer circles and things like that, that uh, if, if we want a, an objective scientific investigation, we should be looking for for an organization like we mentioned api that that might uh adhere to certain protocols if we want a therapeutic invest a therapeutic relationship with someone yes we should be looking for a trauma specialist a psychoanalyst someone that that has ethics to keep your story confidential they're not looking to hypnotize you for book material I mean, that shouldn't need to be said, but it does seem to need to be said. And uh, th thanks to both of you. I think that that's some important stuff to address. Yeah, absolutely. One question I have for, for both of you is, you know, do you, I keep waiting for a, 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 some kind of you know, um, um, new sort of uh, flowering of the as an abduction narrative which uh, which I, and I think this is a good thing it hasn't doesn't seem to have happened at all for you know for a very long time I wonder what your thoughts are and why that hasn't made everything else has kind of come back but except that and is, is that because people are actually um a just generally a little more knowledgeable about in about um you know human psychology and and um anomalous states and experiences or what what are your thoughts that would certainly be a nice thing to think about i think unfortunately like everything in the ufo topic will probably see at some point in time a resurgence of of that you know unfortunately so Jack, how do you feel? I, I agree entirely with that. I think it'll resurge. I think the 80s and 90s was a resurgence of contactees from, from the mid 20th century. And I, I think all of the above is what has kind of slowed the tide for a while. I, I think it, it gets slowed down when technology surpasses the the reasons we were being told that the mystery couldn't be solved. Um, like we, we do have a number of ways now to do um, cost effective DNA testing, cost, you know, um, uh, you know, for a while there, one of the narratives was the disappearing fetus syndrome. And um, now the, there is technology to uh, do uninvasive tests on females to, to check for years, sometimes decades after the fact, to, to check uh, an apparent pregnancy. Um, there's certainly more surveillance equipment than, than, than you could conceive. So there, there's, they're, they're having to work at it to, to loop back around to how this is escaping detection, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they um, will, because as we know, Jacques Vallée has 
said that it, and, know, and again a bit of a head. disclaimer here mm -hmm. uh I, I i think each of you know where i'm coming from and i feel like i understand where each of you are coming from but i will clarify this is not to suggest that that everyone that has reported some type of anomalous experience needs a psychoanalyst for for hallucinations or is lying or or is conducting a hoax. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to say that there's nothing new under the sun, but my research suggests, yes, we can look at a large body of evidence that has been compiled under extremely questionable circumstances. So that that's kind of where um, my thought process comes from is I'm open to new material. I'm open to the wonders of the universe. I, I just don't expect them to be coming um, from uh, what, what we might generously call unreliable narrators. Yeah, I absolutely second that. You know, I, I'm always genuinely fascinated to hear people's experiences and encounters and nine times out of ten they are genuine you know puzzling experiences it's just unfortunately occasionally you, do, you know when there are certain occasions when it's clear that there's something you know um uh deeper and you know, more troubling going on but you know i i, I firmly uh, subscribe to the belief that weird shit is happening to people all the time <laughs> and they don't all necessarily talk about it or report it but Absolutely. um but um, but yeah it's it's yeah slightly you know even i remember back in the uh early yeah what in the 90s when you know, magonia ran they were complaining of this very thing like why why has no one come up with a new <laughs> a new phenomenon we need a new yeah, we need a new phenomenon um and uh you know i think someone came up with a uh, small foot very tiny anomalous footprints appearing on window panes <laughs> um, but uh you know we it, it, we are um perhaps the kind of recurring cyclical nature of these anomalies is is it actually some you know um for a scientific experiment to be conducted properly you need repetition you know you need repeatability so perhaps the fact that actually these things are cycling round and round is perhaps in a weird way a suggestion that um there is some core you know uh, core reality is not the right word but you know core manifestation to them that you know, is is recycling i personally i don't believe that i think it's about the way human minds are you know, wired to uh, interact with with their surroundings, but no, anyway, sorry, a bit of an unhelpful <laughs> digression there. Um, um, yeah, I um, don't know. I, I, do you? I mean, another question for you guys is: Do you think the current wave is sort of sub, has, is subsiding? Now, do you think do you think the congressional report was the crest of the wave, and it's will be kind of um, slowing down for a little while? I I do. Yeah. But, but I mostly you know say that because I like to stay off UFO Twitter. But if I got back on UFO Twitter, I might see that <laughs> there was a way. I don't know. I know. I think it's it's going to die back down again. And then you see yeah. the usual suspects disappear and go into their little rabbit holes, and then come up with you know, more stuff and then Serpo again and MJ-12 again. And so they need, I, you know, they need to go on vacation. So one, so hearing you mention Serpo, one one thing I have started to wonder, just given the timing, is whether the Serpo story that we sort of butted up into when we started the very beginning of our Mirage Men research, uh, whether that had some connection to what, you know, what would later much later emerge with um you know these um small kind of um bodies within the department of defense and the intelligence services that were starting to kind of coalesce around the ufo subject under a server kind of relationship with them that's 
now just yeah I, I don't i'm i'm just i've been wondering this for a little while just start to see some of the dates lining up in interesting ways and, and one that yeah the thing i would say with when john lundberg and i started actively thinking about and working on mirage men it must have been 2000 and what four or five and um you know you couldn't have found a subject with less life in it than the ufo subject there was just literally no interest anywhere yeah couldn't that any, is fascinating i yeah. couldn't get any media organized everyone would just say no thanks not ufos no thanks uh even you know even 40 and times wasn't barely rats you know stopped running ufo stories all the ufo magazines were dead all the ufo organizations shut, were shutting down so it really was like um it felt like you know maybe the the topic would ne <laughs> was done you know it was over so it's really just incredible to see um what a triumphant resurgence it's had so culturally in the past um past few years but um, and I, again, I do wonder if you, things like Serpo and the, the release of the Nimitz material and things, there's just these little attempts every now and again to kind of inject some, some life into the subject. And one of them at some point will, will, um, you know, will be the, the, the shot in the arm that's needed. Um, um, but, um, yeah, again, can, Congrats to whoever was behind Serpo on keeping it <laughs> a, a, a mystery to twenty almost twenty years later that you, you've done well. Your your discipline is is remarkable. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is, and I have yeah. to probably tip my hat to Hal put off on that one, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean the same names run through. It feels like all of it, you know, and. Um, I don't doubt that there are disagreements within the inner circles among some of the people um, about directions that things should go, the w things that should be released or withheld. But I also don't doubt that a lot of that has been misrepresented as well. I, I know in James Carrion's work, he... Uh, wrote about that the way to to get people to believe a story is to get your personnel to believe it and then uh because because they're gonna tell their loved ones their friends don't tell anybody but and then you've got stories all over town about i know a guy that thinks sounds yeah. like in walker ranch wow how fun yeah and and to illustrate this you know james went all the way back to the 1940s and showed how british intelligence was just very skilled at, at sending out stories from multiple locations that, that would make it feel like you were getting um, confirmation from different sources and uh, the way that um, people within the ranks would, would be deceived and think that they were read into projects and circumstances that that uh, appeared to be just part of the deception to to, you know, get get people to buy in. And uh, so I think that would be a part of it, too. And like, like to be more specific, are they arguing in the Pentagon about demons or angels or aliens? Sure, maybe some of them are. And maybe some of them are spreading the stories to because that's advantageous for some reason. I don't right. know. Well, that's it. We'll have to have Mark. We'll have to have you back. And I know that we've kept you over the time that we told you that we keep you. But I could. I, there's so many questions. I know yeah. Jack and I both have. Well, we just got started warming up, but <laughs> that's, that's how, how it works. No, I, I would be happy. As I say, I'm sort of tentatively just. Well, my uh, it's becoming more possible for me to do a bit more public-facing stuff after a few years. So. I am, I am, yeah, I'm happy to, 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 to chat anytime. Um, Ooh. whether at, at, at this point, um, I'm not really, again, just, I don't have the time to be, or space to be, um, actively kind of 
researching or investigating. I, I have got a couple of writing projects are bubbling away that one of which taps into a little bit taps into mirage men material mm -hmm. but um I, it's, I don't want to jinx it by <laughs> talking about it at this point but uh, it would it, it's it definitely um carries certain themes carry through from it but um um but yeah i'm i'm uh just i'm i'm enjoying kind of yeah there was there are new strands of research that are appearing from within the field that i'm sort of finding um interesting and and rewarding um so that's that's kind of in, encouraging me to return a little bit so we'll good. we'll take it because i am a bit, i mean I, I know that i just have always looked at your work over the, the years and and i go back to you've done a great lecture that i've watched a million times again the abuses of enchantment for uh, yeah. deception the disinformation age and that is such an important lecture for me and so i oh, definitely recommend people go back and, and listen to that and really learn yeah. from what you've said I, there. I wish um yeah if i if i the funny thing was was i wanted that to be the seed for the for a follow-up book to Mirage Men, but my then publishers uh, said it was too dark and they wanted something so uh, lighter. <laughs> and I was, and at that point, various things sort of changed direction. So I never was able to pursue it. But what I'm, again, what I'm tentatively working on now does again fold some of that material in. Um, but I mean, having said that, what we've seen in the past, you know, what, uh, so six or seven years, yeah, we've seen the practice and um, perf yeah, um, sort of increased uh, honing of dis disinformation tactics in the digital age just reach, you know, levels that a lot of the stuff that I thought was speculative in Mirage Men now seems hopelessly naive in terms of, you know, what's, what we've seen has actually been going on. It wasn't going on at the time I was working on Mirage Men, but has started happening in the, in the sort of uh, online and digital communication sphere since, um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we've sort of entered a new and, and quite troubling phase, I think, in, in, in the sort of, yeah, to use the very abuses of you know, uh, and enchantment and 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 um and this the manipulation of people's reality is kind of happening in a really extreme way i think i mean i know you probably want to wrap up one i i just want something i also wonder about is um why do you think ufo's stayed out of the queue story or why did Q stay out of the UFO story? Do you have any thoughts on that? Or is it just a separate narrative that the narratives you don't cross the streams or this I was wait I was again waiting for that kind of merging to, to happen, but it doesn't seem to have I don't know. But, I think it did a little bit to some degree. Bit, okay. You know, um what Jack, what are your thoughts on that? The whole thing is just so fascinating and I've had personal experience with that but i mean what do you jack what do you think jack's frozen oh dear <laughs> they, <they laughs> i will say though that, you know with with regards to like the QAnon thing and like you look at people like david wilcox and and corey good and some of the people that are in the ufo space that have promoted the conspiracies that we see in in q anon i think that is is fascinating so whether they're promoting ufos are here there goes jack i don't know what happened so we're, we'll have to wrap it up by ourselves i know he's going to be sad about that but so that that is it, it is interesting to see how people that distrust the government and are, have a potential to kind of want to move into that space have you know have kind of i don't know what come in into that and jack and i've done quite a few shows on QAnon and and the UFO community and the crypto community, we just oh, did a show. Sorry. I, then I'm just, this is just displaying my. Um, no, no, uh, no. In a, in a, the fact that I haven't been paying attention. No, <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. You've got, you've got things going on in your, on, in your own front. You've got so much going on, but that's something Jack and I have been really 
digging into, and it's been fascinating to me. I think the way belief systems can be leveraged uh, and manipulated for purposes that aren't for the greater good. And like you say, there's something happening right now specifically that is is not not a great thing. So we just need to be cognizant of that. And then if we're delving into the UFO community, we need to make sure that we're doing research above and beyond and outside of the UFO community to verify specific things. Oh. So Jack, we're sorry we lost you. What are your closing thoughts on, on the QAnon UFO topic? No. I'm telling you. <laughs> He's seen it here. <laughs> it's a sign. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, <laughs> we'll um, have I'll, I'll, I'll have to look for your, I'll, I'll try to find, uh, or perhaps I'll ask you to send me some of your sort of conversations on that subject, because that was that would be really interesting. Um, um, but yeah, I, I was puzzling over. It, it, it must have been. It was. Hap it sounds like it was happening within the you know the, within the UFO community to an extent, but didn't might perhaps break out uh, out from there. Yeah, it was interesting. It, the, it, one of the last, well, the last UFO conference I went to was um, a few months back up near Skinwalker Ranch, and you know there were ways that the QAnon, like some of that conspiracy theory was was popping in to what was being uh, talked about. And so we, we'll, I'll send, we'll send you some things. And yeah. it is really, really, really nice to actually talk with you. I saw you, I was in an elevator with you right. at UFO <laughs> Congress. You're like, dear Lord. <laughs> <laughs> which um which where was that that was in phoenix oh yeah sure that's in, that what, was, 2017 um, no uh, maybe, I think 14? It was a, maybe more like 16 maybe uh or 15 even but i don't know yes that that was my last visit to a one of the big conferences and i had a, had a great time actually um yeah, that was fun. i would that's i actually gave the um abuses of enchantment presentation there and I got told off for not talking about UFOs by a few people, but I was going. It was all about UFOs. <laughs> you just. I was, even, in fact, I remember watching that and I and just sitting there feeling like, I mean, I, I could, yeah. It's always hard when you're getting up there and you're talking to a crowd and you're you're saying things that are, might challenge belief systems and things. And so I I remember that and I remember seeing you in the elevator and I think it might have been after that. Um, after you had spoken and you were just very, had that kind of demeanor where you were pulled in a little bit and things. And I, I, it was so, I, I just remember that, but that was a poignant um, experience to meet you. I think oh. Tom DeLong might've been at the same conference, I really know. Right. which was interesting. He was, yeah. uh, you know, putzing around with his little cap on. And I don't think anybody even knew who he was. Sure, and that was before TTSA, the big, story that year was Bob Lazar, wasn't it? Just, yeah, because that's yeah. the year that Lazar and Corbell and Stan mm -hmm. Friedman had the big blowout on stage, right? Yeah. Was that the year that you were there? Yeah, so that was a, I mean, really interesting then in terms of what happened in the, you know, in the years following, if you had, you know, um, that was basically the, the sort of next phase of the story being, um, being sort of taking shape, I suppose, there, but um oh good no it's oh, it a shame we didn't meet then but i'm glad we we've, we've met now so. yeah no I'm, I'm very grateful of that and i still well i'll have you back because i still need to ask you about the interview you did with stan friedman or the, the little bit that i saw where stan was in the audience and he got up and he was questioning oh, yeah. you about everything was that it was that it the... that was there as okay. well yeah yeah that was um yeah that was um who was that who i can't remember who else was up there but he yeah he was um went from being quite dismissive of what i was doing to very encouraging so that was nice um by all accounts he was a, a great guy stan friedman and well, as a as a person whether whether although he did do i don't want to talk about it on air but he <laughs> did um yeah. he kind of ruined a british ufo researcher's life in a pretty terrible way um, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, that's another yes. story. It's, yeah. that, and I remember that's a story that Barry Greenwood has told me 
mm-hmm. uh, several times. And it's interesting with my the Anne Ruffle archives here, um, I've been able to look at correspondence over the decades, you know, dating back from the you know 60s specifically with regard to specific researchers. And that's been very eye opening about whether, you know, their feelings on specific people and the way things panned out and the politics behind the scenes and mm. the attempts to discredit other researchers. So that's interesting, but I appreciate you talking a little bit about that. And I, we are just getting warmed up and so you have to come back. Yeah, I'm really looking forward great. to it. Um, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, apologies for <laughs> just going off on long rambling digressions as I, as I You know what, that, it fits right in with the show because I, I, get, I think the best stuff is just rambling. You know, you go <laughs> different places and things and it's been really enlightening. So best of work on your, your new projects. We'll look forward to hearing about it when you okay. come back. I hope we. I hope they will <laughs> become projects. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, lovely to Thank chat you. to Erica and Jack, and um, yeah, I'll be, we'll be in touch. I'm sure. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure. Take Bye, care. Mark. Take care. Bye. 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 So, if you want to learn more about Mark Pilkington, which you, I mean, I hope that you know he's he's so fabulous and he's been just a a real inspiration I think to both Jack and myself you can go visit markpilkington.org.uk to learn about his his not only how creative and brilliant he is but you can learn about some of the the things his his publishing company all of these great things it has been such a pleasure to be here and I want to just thank all of my friends this is kind of cool to do this on a Monday afternoon Jack, because I am seeing the same people that are usually, usually, you know, in here, but a lot of people from all over the globe in chat tonight, which I am kind of digging. So we might have to mix it up a little bit and have shows at different times. And then maybe do like with this show, since this was supposed to go out on Friday night, (laughs) but you know, the, the gremlins happened and here we are. But this is kind of cool. Things happen. Things happen. And so I'm going to replay this show on Friday night and then get into chat and see what other people have to say. But um, yeah, so just it's been a wonderful conversation, Jack. Thanks for, for hooking up Mark on the interview. And what a fun time. And I want to thank everybody out there for listening to the show, for supporting us and our work. And Tracy, good to see you and, and all of you at Earth. Welcome to the show. Uh, Scott it's it is you are the reason that that we're really here uh and care so much about this not only the subject but people involved who have experiences people who wanted to learn more about different topics you can go to expanding frontiers research.org to subscribe to our blog and you can also donate there to help keep the organization going there are a lot of behind the scene costs to do FOIA requests to keep the website online to do the the show for expanding frontiers research formerly known as ufo classified and so i want to thank the people that help keep the show on the air and i also want to encourage you to go in and thank you for the the super sticker uh, make sure you go in and support the show we need it we have so many good things coming up in fact february jack i think is going to be our month to shine what do you say Yes, we, we have quite a few things coming along. We'll have a new blog post up soon, a uh, number of things happening. And this has been interesting with the uh, with the Expanding Frontiers YouTube show here that thanks for facilitating it, Erica. And there's a time difference that, that makes it uh, complicated to do live shows at night from the States with people in England. And each of the previous two guests were in England was, was how we ended up doing this. And uh, it, it has been interesting to kind of show us some ways we can try some different things as well. And not always just do everything because it's the way we've been doing it. Yeah. Well, let's get spicy. It's 2023 and mama needs to mix it up. Are you scared? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be scared. And a little excited all in one. So <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Jack. I appreciate it. And I want to say, Tracy, I love you. It's good to see you in chat. So thank you all very much. And we will catch you here. Um, well, we'll catch you here when we catch you here. You'll, you'll hear about it. <laughs> and then we'll see you. So thanks, you guys. Have a good one.